My name is Pavlos and I am a part of the team at the Games Forest Club uh, with my experience in biodiversity science and ecosystem restoration. I have worked uh, on ecosystem restoration for almost 15 years. I did my PhD research in Southeast Asia and Southwest China uh, with indigenous communities as an ethnobotanist and plant taxonomist but the focus of my research was always ecosystem restoration and how we can use indigenous knowledge around indigenous plants to uh, build biodiversity based and carbon rich uh, land use systems. Um, I want to just uh, tell you a couple of things about the process of this webinar. My colleague Lisa is going to be harvesting any questions which we are invited to add in the comments and she will share with me and we will discuss those at the end of uh, our uh, polls uh, input. And also I want to let you know that we are recording this webinar. Uh, you probably got a message from Zoom already, but uh, just announcing, asking for, kindly for your consent. Um, let me just check. Okay, Georg has um, um, shared the YouTube uh, channel of this 10 weeks to save the games industry video blog that Maria is doing. You are welcome to join and watch and share and discuss and engage with this content. And I'm going to share my screen now um, with a few slides um, to help us guide through the webinar. So I think you all can see my, uh, my slides now. Um, just very briefly for context, we, uh, Paul will share his insights and year-long knowledge on agroforestry and the work he's doing at the Gula Gula Food Forest Program in Indonesia, in West Sumatra. But uh, our discussion today is within the context of carbon resilience through carbon offsets. Um, carbon offsets are also known as uh, carbon credits, which are certificates which represent one ton of carbon dioxide that is either prevented from being emitted into the atmosphere or absorbed from the atmosphere as a result as a carbon reduction project. Obviously, we are the game's forest and we like to support um, nature-based solutions, nature climate solutions, forests. We want to support the communities on the ground that are creating new forests or are protecting standing forests. So they ensure that they keep absorbing carbon uh, in the long term. Um, so our preference is on projects like um, um, agroforestry, uh, assisted regeneration, uh, reforestation and afforestation projects that had to do with planting, protecting and stewarding trees. And to generate carbon credits, a project needs to demonstrate that uh, the greenhouse gas reductions are real, right? That the money are put in a good cause. They are measurable. They're permanent, meaning that this carbon is not at risk of being emitted in the future into the atmosphere. They're additional, meaning that uh, the carbon project would not take place without the support it receives from donations and payments from uh, carbon investors. Mm -hmm. And it's also independently verified and unique. So there is a whole chain of factors that um, own design, uh, verify, uh, market, and own uh, these carbon credit schemes. Um, and as I said, our, our, our most beloved way is trees, uh, which can absorb significant amounts of carbon as part of their biology, and therefore play a very big role in carbon projects. So the journey that a company usually has to do is to first understand what is their own emissions, uh, to try to reduce them and try to offset uh, whatever cannot be reduced through this type of products, projects. And um, they receive a certificate that kind of validates their payment towards um, these carbon solutions. Um, every time that a carbon credit is purchased, uh, it is removed from the market. So a carbon credit, this one ton, of carbon is unique. 
So once a company claims a certain amount of carbon uh, emission reductions, these are taken off from the market and they cannot be uh, accounted again. Um, and once a certificate is issued, it cannot be sold again. So each ton of carbon dioxide emissions avoided or removed from the atmosphere can only be accounted for once. And each of those um, offset projects is very carefully scrutinized and assessed in terms of its integrity, but also the co-benefits that it generates in terms of environmental and social gains, such as biodiversity protection, community resilience, economic development, and of course, these are all aspects that influence the price and the value of the project itself. That's why it's very difficult to uh, come up with a set price of carbon credits because there are all kinds of, of factors into those natural or nature-based systems that need to be constantly evaluated and uh, put into the market with transparency. On the right panel of the slide, I show you uh, how a carbon certificate looks like. This is a carbon certificate that we, the Games Forest Club has purchased from the Gula Gula Food Forest Program uh, last month. Um, and it is showing the serial numbers of the carbon credits, uh, the, the vintage of the year, the standard and verification body, the retirement date. As this is kind of, a, uh, this is the proof that uh, the project has received this uh, support to absorb 480 tons of carbon, 480 credits. Mm -hmm. So how a company or a, a, an individual can offset the carbon, their carbon footprint with the Games Forest Club, it is a certain journey that we want to inspire. And we want to be leaders in the gaming industry because it is an industry that has massive scale it is an industry that is larger than music and cinema combined. So you can imagine uh, if an industry is opening up to a, a, an audience of over 3.2 billion people, it also has a massive carbon footprint. So one discussion within the industry is how uh, companies can uh, introduce new technologies uh, that uh, uh, promote energy saving and resource saving or uh, promote games that support good causes like fighting climate change. Um, but then, of course, some emissions cannot be uh, eliminated. So we offer a journey to offset those in a transparent and, 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 and quality way. Uh, but of course, in order to solve the problem, you need first to measure it. You need to know how much carbon emissions a company emits. That's why uh, we, 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 we we empower those uh, industry actors to start by um, engaging into some sort of carbon accounting to estimate their annual uh, carbon dioxide footprint from their operations. And this includes production, uh, production of software, traveling, buildings, all those have a carbon footprint that companies should be able to, to know. And then based on that knowledge and measure, measurable, um, um, let's say measurable footprint, um, kind of uh, motivate them to put those in paper as a climate strategy with concrete targets. And with those targets, suggest and identify an appropriate carbon forest-based project from our portfolio, and then make carbon credit purchases and issue certificates. And then next year, repeat this cycle. And we are already working with a few pioneers within the gaming industry. So our commitment as a nonprofit is to continuously research and onboard carbon projects of the highest quality that meet the criteria that I have mentioned before, to consistently monitor, monitor the restoration progress through modern technologies, including satellites, but also data which are coming from the projects themselves, to provide tailor-made support to all the carbon investors and all the member donor members to the Games Forest Club, and of course, to give a good shout out to those uh, pioneers in climate action within the industry, hoping that this will have a scaling out effect. So I'm, 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 I'm closing by just mentioning a few things about agroforestry. It is a very highly respectable 
land use system. The title, as the title says, it's a combination of agriculture and forestry. It is a farm that has trees inside. Uh, it has a three-dimensional structure with trees, shrubs, plants growing on trees, things growing under the trees like honeycombs, mushrooms, flowers, plants that have a value in the market. Uh, so the communities that live inside those man-made forests um, can have a living out of this, uh, out of the land, and they also have an incentive to promote them. But at the same time, by enriching those lands with new trees and new plantings, um, we create very important ecosystem services like increased climate resilience and carbon sequestration through the new trees. We provide habitats uh, for biodiversity and wildlife. We improve the quality and integrity and the life of the, of the health of the soil and reduce uh, soil erosion and overall increase the productivity of per hectare in the land. And all this has also social benefits. Uh, it, it, it diversifies the income and the livelihoods of farmers who, who do not have to depend on a single monoculture, but on diff different crops coming from their land. And also they are able to harvest food timber, non-timber forest products um, that can use for their own substance or sell in the local mar market. And the cycle goes on, like then you have improved water quality and availability to those uh, rural communities and you have better agricultural practices, uh, less synthetic fertilizers and pesticides. So this is overall the concept of agroforestry and Paul will, um, um, will, will land will take us on a journey to West Sumatra with some uh, stories and photos about the Gula Gula project. Before I close, I want to announce uh, our next webinar where we will go deeper into the voluntary carbon markets. We want to empower you, the carbon investors or potential carbon investors with all the tricks that we use in order to uh, select the best projects out there. Uh, we feel that this market can have a the best value when the investors are themselves able to, um, to choose to select what is the quality product, uh, quality carbon project. And um, Lisa, at some point, please share in the chat uh, the link, the registration link to this upcoming webinar. So we already have some people from this time uh, to the follow up. So I'm finishing here uh, by introducing our good friend here at the Games Forest Club, um, Paul, Paul Burgess, uh, who is a human geographer by background. He has uh, worked eight years in the World Agroforestry Center uh, with uh, fieldwork experience in Zimbabwe and Indonesia. He has obtained a PhD in agroforestry systems in Indonesia and all this knowledge is the knowledge base now for uh, these high diversity systems that you will hear about in West Sumatra in the Gula Gula project. So um, I'm going to change the slides for Paul and I'm passing mm -hmm. the floor to him. And uh, as always, if you have questions, then please write them on the chat and um, we will be able to address them in, at the end. Okay. Over to you, Paul. All right. Thank you, Pavlos. And thank you, everyone, for joining and listening to my presentation of the work that we've been doing since 2010 in West Sumatra. And can I change the slides or you change the slides, Pavlos? I do. You do it? Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so we started in 2010 and as a, so we are a social enterprise. So we have a mission driven uh, company where we reinvest our profits into new projects. And that's at the moment guided by uh, two major uh, yeah, developments in the world, which is of course the Paris Climate Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals for everybody will have to adhere to in one way or the other, now or in the future. And even if, if we are to meet the Climate Agreement of Paris, as you can see, we cannot do that by just 
setting up renewable energy because we have to reduce carbon emissions from the air. And that can only be done by, if you don't want to have expensive uh, projects of, of storing carbon, I think the easiest and most interesting way is by planting trees because they do it for you. They sequester the carbon from the air and give you back oxygen. So why not planting trees? So that's how we started in 2010, together with uh, the World Agroforestry Center at that time with my colleagues to start experimenting. Okay, next, next slide. So as, as, as Pavlo said, we started in, in West Samata, you see Padang, that's still our flagship project. We have since two year project in uh, West Timor, started two years ago, we hope to get it certified on the Plan Vivo this year. Uh, we have a site in West Java where we are working on uh, palm sugar from Arenga palm sugar from the forest palm Arenga. And we are starting up this year in South Sumatra, the blue one on the left. So we're already mapping the area and we hope to start also in Flores by the end of this year. And we are now discussing with the NGO there, which are good friends of us, how to make a project in Flores. Next. And so, as I said before, when we're talking to Pavlos and Georg, said it would be nice to have every year a new island to, to add to our project. <laughs> so Sulawesi is another one. There are some people. So maybe in 2024, we will have a circle in Sulawesi as well. OK, next. So what is our approach? Apparently, we are quite uh, unique in what we do. We are not having a simple carbon project. Uh, we call it pro-poor carbon offsetting. So we do build agroforestry on degraded land. But we don't stop there. We are also helping the communities uh, adding value to the products that they get from the agroforest. Because in many cases, uh, farmers are also stuck in poverty because they are selling the raw product like coffee. They just buy the unprocessed, sell the unprocessed coffee beans, which is a very low price. So we are, have set up coffee processing units in the village where we, villages where we work and where they have planted coffee. So they're now selling the green beans and we are buying the green beans for a, for a higher price than what they normally get. So they will add more income uh, for the family because they can sell semi-processed or processed products. And we are now looking at uh, importing the first 100 kilogram of coffee. It's about to be shipped and then we are going to experiment in here in my town, Warden, with a small roasting company, which is another good project because this roasting company only hires uh, homeless people and refugees. So that's also how we try to make a holistic approach to do everything uh, with people who are disadvantaged, so to speak. Yeah, next. So what do we do? We start from degraded land. You can see West Sumatra on the right, severely degraded areas. And west and the, west, and the left side is a project in West Timor, which is even more degraded. That's uh, very interesting because Timor is quite dry. So my, my Zimbabwe experience comes in very handy in, in Timor because it looks very similar to what I've worked on in Zimbabwe. So that's that's quite interesting. So why do we start from degraded land? As I said before, because we want to bring back trees on the land to sequester carbon from the air, which is a very crucial phase to achieve our climate goals in the world. Uh, the addition, the, yeah, the, the carbon gains are most beneficial on degraded land because you start from almost zero. Our baseline is around five tons of carbon. So we build up to over 300 tons of carbon. So we have a very high additionality. Also because it's degraded, our additionality uh, is secure. As Pavlos mentioned in the beginning, it's a very crucial component if you want to achieve any carbon credits. 
uh, and certify them. And of course, livelihood improvements very significant because it's land that has not been used for, for many years. In our case, it's over 20 years of degraded land. So that's already uh, a lot that hardly any project seems to achieve that we have this long, long-term uh, degraded area that we are now bringing back. And people are now getting benefits from the forest, the agroforest that is coming back. Next. So how do we work? Uh, we, we work with nature, not against nature. So we make use of uh, natural processes of, uh, of reforestation so that farmers are not in need to hire a lot of labor because nature does a lot of the work for us. Uh, this is called assisted natural regeneration, something we have tested in 2012 together with uh, FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization. So, so it's very simple. The farmers only need a, a wooden plank and, uh, and a piece of rope to press the weeds and grasses that are still surviving on these lands. So even the poorest farmers can join our program because all they need is a piece of wood. And everybody has that somewhere in the garden or somewhere in the house. Um, all we do is we press the grass. You see on the right what we do uh, discuss with farmers at any trees that are trying to compete with the grass to survive. Not to, to press them or destroy them, but keep them in the land. So you already have some tree cover after pressing and these trees are getting now light and sunlight so they, they grow very fast. Even farmers were very surprised when we, after one year, how fast the trees grow because that turned out they already have developed a good root system. But since the grass is competing with them, they didn't grow very well, but now they grow very fast. You can also see it's a really nice blanket. So it's also climate proof because uh, evapotranspiration is uh, yeah, stopped. The, the, the water doesn't, the, the moisture doesn't get out from this land because it's really an isolation blanket, which is on top of the land. So even in dry seasons, uh, it's very moist below and the trees can grow quickly. The moisture also affects the, the grass that is being pressed. Uh, because it, it starts to decay because it's so moist and humid below. So we are adding the nature, natural uh, carbon is being added to the soil. And at the moment, we are doing research on, on how much carbon uh, is actually being absorbed in the soil from, this, from these weeds. But sometimes you cannot do pressing because we have a ferny, type of uh, vegetation which bounces back after pressing so then there's only a chance of using a a tree cutter a tree cutting to cut cut the ferns but then still you make a nice blanket as well so they leave it on the land and they don't burn it it just gets decayed by the moisture and the the, the heat from below next so it's a kind of a natural fertilizer yeah Timor is a different story because, as you can see, we don't have any weeds growing on the land. It's very bare land because of the long dry season. The, the, so what we do there, we have to build biomass first. So there's a lot of uh, Gliricidia trees, which you see in the left below, which are growing on Timor. And Gliricidia is a nitrogen fixing tree, so it adds a lot of nitrogen to the soil. So what the farmer, what we do with farmers, we cut branches and we just put the branches in the, in the ground like that. And they start to develop roots and turn into trees. So there's after one year, you can already see a lot of branches are evolving. It's, it's the same with our willow trees in the Netherlands or in, in Europe, you can also put a stick in the ground and it uh, will grow into a new tree. So we let it grow for two or three years. And then the biomass will accumulate because there's a lot of leaves which will fall to the ground on, in the dry season in Timor. So on the right, you can see an, a kind of a three year old Gliracidia forest with a lot, uh, quite a thick layer of biomass 
and this is the start for us to start intercropping useful trees for other people in, in Timor. Next, please. Yep. So if we do this uh, and we will only work with the communities and we let them decide what they want to plant after the in initial ANR techniques. So they choose the three species. We do not force them to plant certain species except for the Lyricidia, but farmers like to do that first. So you can see, depending on farmer choices and, and their management ideas, you will have a very heterogeneous type of systems in the landscape, very intense on the left, upper left, which is robusta coffee, cinnamon trees, fruit trees, about eight, nine different species together. Some are a bit more open, like the, on the, the third one, because farmers uh, decided to to plant chili peppers for the first two years as an intercrop on the, as an understory. So now we are working with them to add additional trees because now the, the chili can no longer grow because of the shade and the competition with the trees. But we can still add trees in the open spaces and that's what we are doing at the moment. So we fill up the gaps after five, six years. On the right hand, uh, some farmers want to have a very open system well it's their choice they want to have a lot of banana trees and uh, below the lady also is coffee arabica and lokina trees and other trees next so with that all with that area of very different types of species trees so we have cinnamon trees we have coffee trees we have clove trees we have all kinds of fruit trees, we have uh, timber trees. So now we found out that, especially for the coffee, because farmers, as I said, getting a very low income from the coffee, we have helped them to set up this drying uh, unit where they can dry the, the beans first, then they can develop the, the green beans, as we say, and then they sell the green beans uh, to us at a very good price. Another one is on the top, it's a distillation, distilling unit for the clove trees. So it's an additional income, they, they sell the cloves, uh, but they can now use the leaves that fall to the ground to put in this distilling unit and there's an essential oil that comes out from there. And that's a very high income. So farmers are really uh, working on this distillation unit because they get a quite a good income from the oil that is being distilled from the, the leaves. So the re remains of the leaves are then taken, taken back by the farmers and put back on the, on the field as, as a fertilizer. So in that sense, the whole circle is round. So we also provide a lot of training to the farmers, which was very interesting for the coffee. The farmers were not never told what they should harvest. So they were just pulling all the the berries from the branches and selling it. So green beans, red beans, all together, which was one of the reasons why they get such a low price because you should only harvest the red beans. And that was in the training was for them really like they said, wow, we never knew this and that's easy. So that's how they, that can be sometimes very simple. And, and we pay them directly after they, they bring the coffee what, what many middlemen do in villages, they don't get paid. They wait till they sell the coffee and then they get paid for the price that they think they got, the middleman got. So sometimes they had to wait for one month, six weeks. And you know, a poor farmer doesn't want to wait for six weeks if he's selling the product, he wants to get cash immediately. So that's what we are doing as well. They come in, we give them a good price. Directly we pay them. And now suddenly so many farmers are, are willing to plant coffee trees where the interest was really no longer there. Now there's a lot of farmers who come to us say, hey, can we get coffee seedlings from you? <laughs> so that's how also, yeah, how you can promote tree, tree, tree farming in uh, as long as you understand the reality of a small scale farmer. So here on the right, it's uh, the, the palm sugar. So we got that one because it's a food product. 
we got them HACCP certified and organic certification. So now they can be exported to, to Europe. Yeah, next. But all this, what we do, of course, we are under a plant vivo certification. We have to provide an annual report every year, proving what we are doing. We have to do constant monitoring of socioeconomic uh, monitoring. So we are looking at income improvements. So our goal is that farmers will get a wage above the minimum wage of the province. We hope to achieve that by the tree planting and yeah, it seems that we are, we are about to reach that level for the, the, the oldest trees that we have, especially for cloves, which will be in the seven, eight years, they will get the maximum uh, production. So then we certainly will, will be able to give farmers a, a wage which is above the average uh, official wage in West Sumatra. So carbon assessment, we have to do once every two, three years. So we have a modeling, we have modeled everything before uh, with Plan Vivo, it's been approved by the experts and external parties in Plan Vivo. But to do the reality check every two years, we do actual measurements in the field. As you can see, we have uh, quite some intelligent ladies and they just, they don't stop even when it's raining, they just continue doing the work. So it's really actual measuring the tree the three diameters and, and getting the, the actual uh, carbon sequestration in the field. And now we are just started, at, especially now this lady with the glasses is now in our sites with five students. They come from Brawijaya University in Mala in Java, and they are doing uh, yeah, below ground biodiversity monitoring. So she's keeping, she's holding a worm. So she's looking at worms, especially because worms are an important indicator of soil health. And so they are looking at uh, collecting a lot of worms, uh, looking at soil quality and changing changes in the soil. So we have the entire spectrum from newly started agroforests to 14 year old, 12 year old agroforests up to secondary forests. They will also see that as the, the ultimate uh, type of agroforestry. So if we can achieve a level which comes close to the secondary forest, which we hope from the 12 year old uh, agroforest, then we can say, okay, we have improved soil quality up to a level where it becomes a kind of forest. And it's very interesting, which I didn't know that the worms you will find in the secondary forest are very different from the worms in an agricultural field. So if we can find worms which are in the older agroforests, which are close to the secondary forest species, we have another proof of uh, our work is moving towards really forest ecosystems. Above ground, we are also starting up now, we do it through bioacoustics, so ultrasounds and we have a German company, Biometrio, who will analyze all this for us. And we hope to get some interesting results from that as well. Next, almost done. Um, Paul, I'm gonna have to ask you to speed up because we are getting some yeah. really questions, which I'm yeah. sure you like answering too. Yeah, so we have, this is our impact now. We are already much further ahead. It's over 500 families and over 500 hectares. Next. So it's our biodiversity. We put up some camera traps before. So we already found there's a lot of animals coming back. So monkeys like to make selfies in our sites. We have the food traps of the, the tiger, Sumatran tiger, which visited once when we were up in our hut. But he comes every now and then we find food, footprints of the tiger. We have the eagles, which is also an apex species, so on top of the food chain. Yep, next. So that proves that there is a quite a good uh, division of uh, animals in our sites. So we find a lot of positive energy in the villages with farmers. 
are happy to really reforest the area and get benefits from it. Next, then we are done, I think. And for ourselves, we are living our dream because we are already in 10 years, if you briefly the previous one, <laughs> then I'm done. The previous slide, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. That one, yeah. yeah. So that's where we started 2010 with all the degraded hills. So we were dreaming of one day they should all be covered in forest. And we never thought that this would already be happening after 10 years. And uh, yeah, so part of it is already, the whole hill is already now full of trees. And that's, uh, my contribution then, <laughs> and our team, okay, team is somewhere. So we are not working alone. There's a big team in West Sumatra doing the, the hard work for us in the field. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Paul. I'm sure we will be able to sit here and, and listen to these stories and more for, for a long, long time, but we do have some really exciting questions, which uh, I yeah. thank you, Lisa, for passing over to me. Um, very quickly, uh, there is one from Christine. Does the calculation of saved emissions also include the cutting down of trees? And I think this comes from the word timber I used in my slide. Um, I think very quickly I can answer that, that like, you know, we're not talking about chopping trees for commercial timber marketing, but those communities have to live and, and you know, heat their food and themselves. And even by pruning those trees, you can generate a lot of wood. So we're talking about very sustainable harvesting methods. And usually the project design itself also includes those um, activities like the carbon awesome. that we um, emitted by this locally used uh, wood. Um, Paul, uh, yeah. Was there any irrigation needed for the Timor project and whether you are supporting the farmers in selecting the plants to be cultivated? Um, you already mentioned that you help with soil analysis and carbon measurements uh, in terms of species selection. As yeah, so for Timor. For Timor, we, we don't do irrigation, so that's why we are building this Grisidia forest first, because that will uh, provide a bit of moisture and it will prevent evapotranspiration because of the tree cover. And we have a biomass layer which will be able to, which also sequester carbon in the soil. And carbon is very important to for water retention capacity. So we we aim to, yeah, to to bring back moisture in the soil because of this intervention. And of course, we will not plant trees which need to be irrigated in Timor. So Kapok is one of the trees which has always been grown in Timor, which is now coming back because we have an off-taker for it. So farmers are double enthusiastic to plant Kapok trees because the market is secure, which is important for small-scale farmers that they know what they plan, that there is actually a market for it. And Kapok can grow easily in, in, in Timor. It can also be propagated by cuttings. And it, it grows like uh, very fast. And it's a good carbon uh, sequester, sequestering tree. So <laughs> you have cotton as well, non-irrigated one. We are experimenting with uh, cotton as an understory which is a local variety. And, and we are looking at three different varieties which will do best. And that's the one we will promote for the farmers. So they have uh, short-term cash. We have some indigenous uh, natural dye trees, which they will plant later on once the, the forest, the Glericinia is, is big enough. So it uh, will be the indigo, indigo color, which is shrub type of, uh, tree which will be an understory which come which grows there naturally so we we make use of natural uh, indigenous trees in Timor especially yeah 
Yeah, there are a lot of species that you can like. You can optimize the use. Uh, in the restoration project I was working in Yunnan in China um, yeah. twelve years ago. The, we were growing orchids, epiphytic orchids, on the trees, and uh, they were taken by a French cosmetic company to make um, um, very high value uh, anti aging cream. Yeah. Um, you would go to the airport in in Bangkok and you see like massive placards and advertisements of, of like the orchids coming from the forest we were building. And the main premise of marketing was that those orchids need to grow into the shadow of trees in mm. formerly dedicated lands. And there is another exciting question coming from um, um, Marie-Anne. Was there any gender problems in your project similar to those reported by some agroforestry projects in Africa? like gender problems in terms of land ownership, cultural values of certain trees or plants. Um, yeah, that's an in, always an interesting question and it's easy to answer. <laughs> and because I lived in Africa where there's a really a big gender issue, I could see in Zimbabwe, women and men are really separate economic units. It's not like that in Indonesia. And especially in West Sumatra, we work in a, matrilineal society. The Min and Kabau in West Sumatra are, uh, yeah, the women are in charge. The women are the landowners. All the men are landless people. So it's the women who are pushing the guys to plant the trees. <laughs> and then that's uh, why, yeah, the, the women in West Sumatra have a very high social position in the village. So for Jenna, we have, in that sense, in West Sumatra, no problem. Because the men are, the men also after marriage will join the wife's family and they live together with the sisters and the mother. And the men are just like the laborer in the family. They have to work in, on the land of the wife. <laughs> so in that sense, it's sometimes the other way around. It's the men who need to be <laughs> supported. <laughs> <laughs> was one of the like uh, apart from the from the amazing work that you do in the ecosystem this strong gender dimension of the Kula, Kula project was kind of a flagship and uh, that was like really really resonated with us and the values of equity and diversity we want to 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 um, represent um again from marianne is the land now protected from being sold to non-farming or non-protection pur purposes, or is there still a chance it will get sold to real estate de development and so on? And I, I'm also interested to know what type of risks do you see for those lands um, yeah. should those projects do not take place? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so West Sumatra is, is really a very unique province. But the same we, we have in, in Timor, where we only work on the Adat, Adat land. So the indigenous customary land rights are really the West Sumatra officially recognized also by the government. So the land is really owned by the village. And there is a village institution who deals with the land issue if there is any. But yeah, the, the, the female lines of the family have their clan, it's the clan who owns the land. So there is no, no issue in, in land uh, insecurity. It's very well defined and we help them on top of that, mapping their land through GIS and remote sensing. So they also have a map to show to the local authorities. And then we overlay the maps with the, the government land. So we make sure we have no no land inside of the, the government area. So whenever there is a discussion, then they can show the map, say, no, no, no. It's our other area, which belongs to the village. So you have no right to do anything there. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's very going, secure. We're going to run a couple of minutes over our time, but uh, we have a last question from Christine. Uh, and I think we should answer all questions. Yeah. Um, so you have just mentioned that severe periods of drought are affecting those lands. Um, um, 
how do the locals deal with the death of trees or forest fires due to drought? Yeah, yeah. yeah so that's an interesting thing for the fires. As you saw the hills just now, uh, it, it has turned back to forest and, and a large part of it has been generated naturally because there were no more fires. Once we started our activities there, the, the entire village was very careful to not throw away the Kratex cigarettes in the in the in the weeds anymore. <laughs> so for for since 2010 uh, there is no more fire. And where it used to be every once or twice, every one, yeah, and once every three years there was a fire. But it stopped completely. So that is another benefit that we, we see from our activities there. For the drought, we do have had an issue over the past two years because the rains are really unpredictable or have been very unpredictable. So we have had some lower survival rates than we usually have. We usually have after the first year an 80, 85% survival. So now, now one year we had only 60, so that 50, 60. But we do a replant and we keep on replanting because we intensively manage the, the, the area for five years. So after five years, we, we are sure we know from our experience, it's all good. So we do have to plant. And then we also depend on the forestry uh, nursery from the Ministry of Forestry. So like last year or in the in Corona time, we got very bad quality seedlings from them. So the, the timber trees that we got from them were so bad that 90% of them died. So now we have our own nursery. So we have now decided to do everything ourselves. So we can, we can control and monitor the quality of the seeds. We buy our own seeds and not depend on, on forestry and hoping we get good trees from them. So we have hired a few experts for seedling raising and, and, and three experts who are now setting up the nursery. Oh, we already had it, but we have uh, almost about 0 0.6 hectare now nursery where we can raise 500,000 seedlings in, in one cycle. And yeah, it's being controlled more better compared to getting it for free from the ministry. So we buy sometimes from Java, from places where we know where you get certified seeds. And uh, the forestry sometimes they not really taking care of their own seeds. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, yeah. it's not, um, it, it has been a really, really big pleasure um, seeing those photos and hearing those stories from from uh, from your lips because it's different to read them on a document and different to to hear from the people that live uh, with those uh, with those projects and uh, for sure all of us in our winter days here in Europe or whether we are we we definitely felt something nice by seeing all these images of regeneration and. Mm -hmm. uh, any congratulations for that and also a big thank you. Uh, our task uh, from our standpoint, wherever we are as actors for the climate is to really work hand in hand with people like you and the people that you represent in Indonesia and try to make this happen. There is so much science and knowledge and technology in our hands today that we can restore nature faster than nature. And probably it is something we have to do and mm -hmm. we have a unique in a lifetime generation uh, opportunity to do that now.